Hey y'all, how you doing? Today we'll be continuing our discussion on quantum nonlinear optics, and this time we're going to solve for the first order, order polarization and susceptibility, quantum mechanically. So recall when we solve for the susceptibility and polarization classically, we expanded in a perturbative expansion the position x of charge i at time t as a first order perturbed part or term which was lambda to the first power times x1 plus lambda squared x2 which is the second order perturbed term plus lambda to the third x3 so on and so forth and since lambda is between 0 and 1, the higher and higher order terms get smaller and smaller. And we plugged it, this into the anharmonic oscillator equation, which eventually gave us the dipole moment. And from that, we got the polarization. So doing it quantum mechanically is going to be very similar, except in quantum mechanics... We don't know the exact position. All we know about a system is its wave function. So we expand the wave function, psi of t, in a perturbative expansion. But we also include the wave function at time 0, or the unperturbed wave function, psi 0. And the rest of it is just done in a similar manner to how it's done classically. So lambda, psi 1 plus lambda squared, psi 2, plus lambda cubed, psi 3, so on and so forth. And recall that we can expand a general wave function in terms of the basis states. So a general state psi at position r at time t can be expanded as a sum over all basis states a with a certain probability amplitude at a certain time times a phase factor and times the uh, basis state itself which is the only spatial dependence part okay so to do this with perturbation theory we just add ends in the exponent of there and of here and so in previous videos, we found the probability amplitudes up to the third order perturbation. So in this video, we're just going to plug that in. Well, in this in the next video, we're going to plug it in up to the third order coefficient. I'm going to use coefficient probability amplitude um, to mean the same thing in this video. Okay, so... We're going to calculate the expectation value of the dipole moment because you don't have an actual value dipole moment. You just have the value you expect. And recall the expectation value of dipole moment D is all you do is sandwich the operator, the dipole operator's mu, sandwich it in between the wave functions. And this is the general wave function. So capital Psi here means the general wave function. Lowercase Psi here means the basis state. Okay. So if you take this equation here, take equation 1 and plug it into 2, then you group all your like terms together in the same manner we did it classically. So you group all the terms with lambda 0, and that's your equation for the zeroth order perturbed uh, dipole expectation value. So in other words, psi zero, that's your zeroth order expectation value for the dipole moment. And similarly, you do the same with lambda to the first, lambda squared, and lambda cubed. And you get the following.
Okay, so there's the equations we get. And what we do now is we use this relation here. I should have called I should have called this equation 2. We use equation 2 and we plug it into equations 4 and we get we get the coefficients from because we already did that so we can plug those in. Um, and so that's what we're going to do here. But recall in a previous video uh, for the perturbation, I just di uh, solved the probability amplitude for general perturbation V. Uh, but here, our perturbation V is going to be, so it's an operator, it's going to be the dipole operator times the electric field, which is a vector. Um, and I wrote the I wrote the perturbation with some subscript on, on it because it was the perturbation sandwiched between some basis states. So I wrote something like V, A, B, um, and in that case, or, okay, so in this video, um, that A, B is just going to go on the mu operator. And I also wrote a an I naught, and the I was the frequency of the electric field. Uh, at time zero. So this is our perturbation for this video. So I forgot a minus sign here. We have to put the minus sign there. And I should mention here, this quantity here, mu a b, so this is just uh, psi A mu psi B. That's all that means, where this and this are basis states. It's the dipole moment that's present when you go from basis state B to basis state A. And it's called the transition dipole moment. Very important quantity in spectroscopy. And you can actually write the dipole as uh, the charge times the distance between the charges R. So that this value would equal um, psi A on negative E R psi B which is the expectation value of the position. That might be something a little more familiar. Okay, so now I'm going to write down what we had in the previous video for the coefficients, just so we have them on paper to recall. Okay, so that's the coefficients we had from a previous video that I did. And this zeroth order perturbed coefficient, all it is saying is we know that the system starts in the ground state G. So there's a 100% probability of the system being in the G state at time T equals zero. Any time after that is... Uh, not definite. We don't know exactly which state the system's going to be in. So if we're not in the ground state uh, at time t equals zero, there's no populated states. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to use these relations and I'm just going to plug in V. So we have 
our new updated perturbed coefficients. Okay, so that's our new coefficients with our specific perturbation to our problem uh, plugged in. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take these coefficients here and we're going to plug them into equation 2. And for this video, I'm just going to do the zeroth order in the first order part. And in the next videos, I'll do the second and third order part. And I'm going to start by um, doing the ket side, and then I'm going to do the bra side. Uh, so let's start with the zeroth, zeroth order perturbation, which I wrote as D0. Okay, so that's the zeroth order expectation value for the dipole moment. That's just the ground state dipole moment. That's, or the permanent dipole moment. The one that's present when the molecule is just sitting there in the ground state and nothing interesting is happening. It's probably what you would have expected. Okay, so now I'm going to solve for the first order perturbed expectation value of the dipole and if we recall that one had two terms like such so first off I'm gonna do the first term and by first term I mean this one Oh, sorry, before I get into that, um, I'm going to do the bra and the ket side of psi 1 here. Okay, here I'm going to explain something tricky with the exponents. So, this e to the i omega a g t, this is just e to the i omega a minus omega g t. So keep that in mind. And so we can rewrite all these exponentials um, like this. And we see that this exponential and that exponential just go to 1. And so we have that these equal e to the negative i omega g plus omega i t. Okay, so that's it for the cat side. Now I'm going to do the bra side, and since we're doing the bra, I'm going to have to take the complex conjugate of this coefficient, or the complex conjugate of this thing in square brackets, which means I'm just going to put a star there and change this i from positive to a negative.
Okay, that's it for the bra side. Sorry, up here I realized I forgot this. Basis state side. Hey. Okay, so there's something a little weird here, which I don't quite understand. Um, but the frequency here is considered as a complex frequency. So that way, um, with sort of foreknowledge, we know that we're going to want to change this minus sign to a plus sign because it's going to turn into the anti-resonance term. So that's why we uh, allow this frequency here to be complex. Okay, so now that we have those and we have that the expectation value of the first order perturbed dipole moments this, now I'm going to do this first term and then I'll do the second term on the next page. Okay, so that's what we get for the first term of this. Notice that we have a transition dipole moment that goes from state G to A, and we also have a transition dipole moment that goes from A to G. So just the subscripts are flipped. And notice this whole part here is just the entire electric field dependence. Well, the dependence of it on time. Uh, okay, so now for the second term. Okay, so there we go. There's the second term. And notice that in this second term, uh, we still have that electric field dependence there. So these two terms I'm talking about. But this time, we have two of the same transition dipole moments. They have the same subscripts. Okay. Um... So for now, so now for the polarization. So remember, D1 is just the sum of these. So add this to this, and that's D1. And the, for the polarization, the polarization is just a macroscopic version of the dipole moment. So all you have to do to get the polarization is multiply by the number of dipoles you have. And to get the units right, you have to divide by the volume. So the polariz the first order perturbed polarization is equal to the number density n times the expectation value of the first order perturbed dipole moment. Simple as that. Now the susceptibility is a little trickier. Because this, well, so the polarization is a vector, and it's got x, y, and z components. And you can write the polarization in direction i uh, as equal to the susceptibility um, with an i and a j here, and the electric field in the j direction and you sum over all j. Yeah, I think that's how you write it. Okay, so by this relation here, um, you can... So Ej is just this whole electric field dependence there. So you take that out, and you consider uh, the different directions and in that way, 
you get the values of susceptibility. So here I'll just give one value of the first order perturbed susceptibility um, and that value is in the x and y not x and y direction but uh, so the subscripts here would be x and y. Okay, so that's the value for the first order perturbed susceptibility. And the second term is a little bit weird. But so for just the first term, all we did is throw out that electric field dependence. And now for the second term, since we took the complex conjugate of this here, that flipped the subscripts G and A. And so that is why this one here is G and A. And also, I'm sorry, but I don't fully understand this. Um, the sign here flips, and I think it's something to do with uh, because it's a complex conjugate thing. I'm sorry, I can't explain it further than that. But this first term here, this is called the resonant term because notice when omega AG, which is sort of the difference in energy between states G and state A, when that is close to the incident electric field frequency, omega I, then this term gets really, really large. And that why, that's why this term is called the resonant term uh, because the phenomena of resonance happens when these two values are very close to zero, or in other words, when this denominator goes to zero. And this over here, the denominator is not going to vary that much, so, and it's going to stay pretty constant, and it's called the anti-resonant term, so the whole term. Okay, so that is finding the susceptibility and polarization to the first order quantum mechanically. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.